All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Packet Hacking Village. Um, it is now, yes, we're in the afternoon part of the session, and uh, I'm just going to make this introduction really quick. I, I, I think I've been doing this for way too long, and it seems like every year, I remember uh, one of the things is, is that when you're here, I think my uh, my introduction to the two of you gets shorter and shorter. So here we go. I will make you know, my, my absolute pleasure. Mike Grego, Chad Hardmer. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Make sure you guys can hear me okay. Sound okay? Yeah. All right. Cool. Uh, so, yeah, um, we'll be presenting uh, Stego Augmented Malware. Uh, which is a combination of a lot of research uh, Chet and I have done over the years um, and, and applied in a slightly different manner. Um, and to really kind of preface this, um, Chet will talk about some of the research he's involved um, uh, with uh, a college that he's involved with, which also kind of sparked some of this additional research and really the presentation altogether. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. So in terms of the agenda, we're going to cover uh, a variety of different types of steganography augmented malware. Try to say that fast five times. Uh, stats, trends, commonalities, differences. Um, some of the research uh, through the college that Chet's involved with had a lot of the students focus on specific variants of malware. And then we started to look more broadly across these different variants to find commonalities, differences, better understand IOCs and TTPs and things like that. And then, as a result, we wanted to better understand how we could detect a lot of these, especially based on their behaviors. And then we'll talk a little bit about our, our ideas really about the future and uh, where we think this may go next. So I'll let Chet introduce himself. Um, yeah, hi, everybody. The, uh, I've been here many years, so you probably know who I am. But uh, the focus of this talk really goes to something that I've been working on for a little over 20 years now. And uh, that's where all the gray and my beard has come from. So we're going to talk about steganography and how it's being applied to uh, malware today, and specifically some work that we're doing at Utica College in one of the programs that I um, operate there, and talk a little bit about some of the student research that's there as well. And I also teach at uh, the University of Arizona, as well as Utica College, and um, at Champlain. So if you're interested in any of those programs, please uh, uh, stop by and talk to me. I'll be presenting tomorrow at 6 o'clock um, as well, so if you want to stop by then. Turn it back to Mike. That was quick. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, like Chet, um, I've presented here uh, many times, and um, Chet and I have collaborated on a lot of steganographic and steganalysis type research over the, the last 20 years or so, I guess, at this point and uh, have done a few books together, too, around covert communications, data hiding techniques, and things of that nature. Um, and so I'd uh, like to thank Ming for having us back again this year. So let Chet first talk a little bit about all the things they've been doing at uh, Utica College, and then that'll really preface what we're going to go through in terms of the research and analysis. Sure. Thanks, Mike. Um, we teach a class at Utica called Cyber 642, which is data hiding and access control. So the, the point of this particular course is to take a, a really in-depth look at what's happening and what is emerging from a data hiding and covert communication point of view. Um, the focus of the course is to look at the latest malicious code um, that includes advanced persistent threats um, that are out there. Um, Mike and I did a talk several years ago talking about the APT Operation Shady Rat, which kind of started this whole gamut of technologies that are used to augment malware in order to be able to make them more or less discoverable. Um, so the whole point of this is to incorporate steganography into malware in order to be able to conceal its existence. Right, so they can communicate from that perspective. So again, in um, recent years, there's been a lot of movement, and Mike's gonna walk through a bunch of those that have come out of the research that we're doing um, at Utica and work that we're doing together. And as Mike said, we've been studying this problem for a number of years, and uh, we've kind of looked at this from several different vantage points. So the students in this class um, discover, this is a, an, a master's class, um, discover and examine a wide range of steganography enhanced malware threats. Um, we've looked at over 30 of these in the last um, year or so. And we want to do this in order to analyze vulnerabilities of the malware along with the steganography methods that are utilized. 
because some of these methods actually use fairly sophisticated stag and others use very unsophisticated stag. So our interest is to understand where those techniques that they're using in order to enhance the malware are potentially vulnerable. So we can actually use those in order to either detect um, or disrupt um, that activity. So we want to develop these strategies that can be allowed to allow us to do detection, response, and mitigation of the threats that are there. In several cases, students have chosen to further um, examine these threats as part of their final capstone or their thesis project um, at Utica. Michael Beatty um, just co is completing his right now, and it's just an outstanding um, uh, paper that will be in public view probably in about three months when he finishes his um, thesis. And that thesis covers a wide range of these and the vulnerabilities that we have um, studied and figured out. Um, I'm the second reader on Michael's um, paper, and I teach the course that I'm talking about. So we spend a lot of time with a lot of different students looking at a lot of different threats that are there. So the catalyst for this presentation comes from a couple of different points of view. One, Mike and my um, um, 20 years of studying this problem and watching the evolution of steganography being used in multiple different ways. And it's interesting, one of the things that we have tend to focus on is on encryption. But less emphasis, even to today, has been spent on the study of steganography and how it actually impacts and how it can evade detection. And now that it's being integrated with malware, um, it's the next level. But some of this has been inspired by the research that we've done and also the research that the students have been doing over the last couple of years in order to be able to take us to this next level. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Mike, who's gonna kind of walk through some of those changes and then I'll bounce back in a little bit to talk about what we're doing about it. In other words, how we can actually use what we figured out in order to do that. So I'll turn it back to Mike. Thanks, Chet. So taking a step back first and looking at ways in which we could categorize these and also determine you know, their level of existence when they first came into play uh, or were released or seen in the wild, um, just started to build out a simple timeline here uh, where you can see you know, a spike an increase, especially over the last four to five years. Certainly this is a very small data set, but over time I'd like to continue to see how this evolves and emerges. But clearly there, there's a growing number of these and it's on the level of potentially exponential. Of the ones that we did some deeper analysis around beyond what the students had done, um, we started to put these into some different categories um, along the lines of uh, banking trojans or crypto jacking. A lot of this was, um, this categorization here was really based on their motives, right? What are they looking to do? Um, in addition, a lot of these, as you might expect, are all related to remote control, CNC, remote access trojans, things related to data theft or uh, espionage. Um, and then lastly, there were some actual um, advertising and ad-related type click-throughs and promos to generate clicks and, and uh, drive uh, traffic to specific sites or specific ads. So one of the ones that was particularly interesting was one that leveraged social, uh, leveraged social media. Um, at a previous um, Packet Hacking Village or Wall of Sheep uh, talk a few years back, I had presented around uh, a lot of these risks and threats across social because it was doing a lot of research at that time across Twitter, Facebook, um, uh, in a variety of other social networks, also uh, streaming media services and things like that. This one in particular um, was found on Twitter, and to give credit, this was identified by Trend Micro. Um, it, the, the premise behind it was that outside of the scope of this, uh, one or more systems had been, you know, let's say compromised, infected with this malware. But where the steganographic component of this starts to come into play is that the malware is out there on a regular basis checking a particular Twitter account, a Twitter account that had been out there for a few years. And whoever owns this account then started to post memes, and within those memes were certain types of commands. So once the meme was posted, the malware I would identify it was out there and parse it, and within it would be a variety of commands that the malware would leverage to run a variety of things, including uh, screen scraping or screen captures and a number of other things. And then additionally, post this stuff to Pastebin. 
Um, and so uh, through Pastebin, it would actually initially obtain a URL of where to post it, and it would either post it back to Pastebin or separate IP or URL altogether related to the CNC. Just at a, a high level diagram here, right, you've got the, the computer reaching out to the social media, it's already infected with malware, and getting updates and commands via Twitter, right? Not Twitter directly, but a meme posted to Twitter. Um, and we'll talk more later about uh, a presentation um, Dr. Phil Tully and I did two years ago um, at DEF CON 25 um, around neural nets and leveraging the ability to not only detect some of these things, but furthermore do predictive analysis. So in this case, it went out to Twitter, uh, parsed this particular meme and other ones that were posted beyond that to gather commands. And from there, it would get information such as a URL uh, to obtain uh, command and control stuff. Um, I'm glad I have this on the screen because it was not only Pastebin but Imgur and, and things like that. Um, and then as a result, the files would be sent to the remote command and control uh, URL that was provided via Pastebin or Imgur or something else. So with this were a variety of commands that, that were run and leveraged by the malware itself. Uh, to capture screenshots of the desktop, um, processes that may be running, um, steal stuff from the clipboard, uh, even potentially the username for the machine and, and documents and things like that. Uh, but it kind of begs a question here for a moment and that is, you know, if you're running an enterprise network, um, how frequently do you have or want to permit enterprise users to be using things like Pastebin. You know, we find in most cases when doing pen testing and network analysis and things like that, that, you know, when looking at it from an ingress or egress standpoint, that this is largely still allowed outbound for posting things. I'll jump into some more of the variants here, but for, you know, as, a, as sort of a, a stepping stone for that, I'll let Ch uh, Chet talk about um, his Raspberry Pi project, which he's actually, as he mentioned, going to present uh, tomorrow as well. Thanks, Mike. So one of the questions is, how do we detect this? Do you care if we detect this? And so the issue is, is the whole point of this operation in augmenting malware in this fashion is so that it becomes not observable, right? Or the observable is very low. So how do we actually go about um, detecting this? Well, there's kind of two different methods that we've actually analyzed and looked at. The first, of course, is we could analyze the images that are being posted or recovered from different sites and basically determine if they have content embedded in them, right? And as I mentioned earlier, some of them are fairly simple in embedding. They may be using a JPEG that has data appending. They may be using a JPEG that actually inserts things in the header of the JPEG to basically communicate the data, whether it be a PowerShell script or something like that that's embedded in those areas that we're not looking at or don't get displayed. But we can detect those relatively quickly and relatively easily. But if they go ahead and modify things like the quantized DCTs and actually embed that information in, in those areas of the image, then the image is going to be compromised and now we have to do more exhaustive analysis of that. And it causes two problems. One is we can miss things and number two, we can um, issue false positives. Neither of those um, false negatives or false positives are a good thing. The second problem is, is that in the deeper analysis of those images, it takes a long time depending upon the size of the image. So it could take several seconds or even longer depending upon the size of the image that we're actually going to try to analyze for the con that it has been compromised or information has been embedded in it. So we got thinking about this and said the second way to approach this is to look at the behavior. Right, we never want to build signature detections anymore because they just don't work, right? Because it is, as soon as the bad guys know that we're doing signature detection, they just change the signature, right? And it's difficult, and that's why most of these things get through in the first place. So I'm not going to talk about the compromise itself of the systems. I want to talk about analyzing the behavior of the malware once it's embedded. Now, remember, these are probably, in most cases, fileless malware. So we're talking about memory resident things that have compromised the system in such a way that these um, processes are running with privilege. And therefore, they're able to actually um, move within that environment without being detected by you know, traditional defenses of those environments. But we do have been doing a lot of work in analyzing the behaviors of 
those operations and they tend to be quite similar. I might kind of walk through a scenario for you already of how this actually works. And most of them work the same way. They have a need, right, to go back to the internet to a public site that is not um, in violation. Typically the way we have done these in the past is we know what CNC sites that are out there that they're using and any connection goes to them, we basically block it, right? So that's a signature detection, right? We've got a signature that this is a bad CNC site. But in this particular, it's not a CNC site anymore, right? Now it's basically Pastebin or Twitter or Facebook or anything that has an image that's going to be downloaded and um, information is going to be gleaned to that as to what to do. And then information is going to be posted back, again, in the form of a JPEG or something else that has the content that we want to exfiltrate from the environment in it. Again, something that's typically going to be ignored. However, when we start looking at privileged applications, right, or privileged processes that are basically posting information to the Internet or going to the Internet and getting information, that becomes unusual. So just one simple example. But the, the point is the defense in depth approach here is to basically identify these behaviors, and that's what we've been studying for the last couple of years, to understand what are those behaviors. And so one of the things that I'm going to present on tomorrow evening is talking about this Raspberry Pi project that I've been working on as well that's basically a passive sensor. So basically the sensor is looking for aberrant behavior within your environment that's outside the norm. And these would be things that would be outside the norm, right? Uh, normally systems are not going to be posting these kinds of images to these particular sites or retrieving them and then um, processing them. So we're basically developing ML models that will allow us to identify these even if we've never seen them before, right? Because they have these characteristics that we're analyzing. So as you know, the first step in doing any kind of ML work is to actually define what am I trying to detect, right? And number two, what are those specific features or characteristics that I want to basically identify that are either good or bad? And then basically be able to build a corpus of those in order to be able to identify those behaviors um, in a more intelligent system kind of approach versus a signature-based approach. And that's what we're doing with the Raspberry Pi Python sensor is basically um, using that sensor in order to detect this abnormal inbound or outbound um, behavior that is being caused by this um, Stego augmented malware that we're in play. Does that make sense to everybody? Any questions about that? Any thoughts about that? I'll stop here for just a second because um, I'm going to be shooting out to go do another presentation, but I want to make sure that I answer any questions that are related to either how the information is being extracted from um, somewhere out in cyberspace to basically, or being pushed there, and how this is actually working, because I know we covered a lot. Pretty simple, straightforward. We, yes, sir. Sure. So that's, a, that's a, a great example. In other words, does this particular process normally go and retrieve images or post images to the Internet? Um, is it a common thing? Now, a lot of processes do that, not just browsers, right? Um, and so where they're going is important, but we don't want to actually identify those from some signature point of view. We want to identify the behavior of when do they do them, how often do they do them, um, and is it something normal for this process to do. So one of the things that the, the malware that we've looked at is they're trying to attach themselves to processes that normally do that, right? But they don't do it um, in the same way. And some of the mistakes that they've made is they use the same images. Right, in order to be able to do those. So we can detect the images or variants of the image. So one of the things that we learned about that, such a great question, is if we see a process, we may not be able to instantly identify it as a problem. But if I take an image that was being posted by that process and I hash it, and then it posts that same image in the future and the hash has changed, what does that tell us? Something different was embedded in that image. It's the same thing in the pull down. This is how we actually detected Operation Shady Red in the beginning. We were seeing images that were posted and retrieved that were the same image, but they had a different hash. 
right? So we're able to identify it in those ways. So obviously, as they become more sophisticated and using different images every time to convey the information, it becomes more difficult. But they they typically aren't that sophisticated because they're trying to actually make that happen in in the uh, in a very quick fashion. Any other questions? Yes, sir. That, that's, that's exactly what we're doing with the Raspberry Pi project. So I kind of invite you to stop by tomorrow at 6 when I'm doing that talk. But basically, we're modeling that baseline and baselining the behavior of that environment. Okay, and based on what's happening in that environment normally, what connections are being made by what devices, over what protocols, at what times of day, what size packets, that kind of thing. We're actually monitoring that and basically creating a semi-supervised learning of that um, environment un under what we would consider normal conditions. Right? And then once we do that, we can use that in order to be able to detect aberrant behavior that falls outside what that normal behavior is of that environment. Now, one of the reasons that we use Raspberry Pi to do that is, first of all, it costs 50 bucks, right? Even the new one. Um, and we can place it in different parts of the network, right? So we can actually distribute this across um, a network that, you know, is much larger instead of trying to do it from a single point. So we may want to monitor things within a certain subnet or certain area that we're mostly concerned about. I don't know if that directly answers your question, but I, I, you kind of get where we're going with that. Anything else? Are, are you concerned about this? Is this something that's ever come up in your discussions? Okay, I'm seeing, this is great because when we've done this in the past, we haven't had a lot of people shake their head yes. So it's great to hear that people are aware, and that's part of what our job here is to make you aware that this is going on and starting to get you to think about um, ways that we can actually do this. Yes, sir. Yeah, we would place the sensors in multiple locations. And like I said, I invite you to stop by tomorrow because I go into that in great detail of how. Okay. But uh, yeah, that's how we do it. We basically place the sensors in multiple locations and we monitor the network over a longer period of time. So this is not a typical vulnerability assessment, pen test, end map. This is something that we look at the behavior of the environment. And the critical thing on the Raspberry Pi is how do we store all that data? So. Sure. Yep. Yeah, we're only looking at flow, okay, in this particular case, but it's how we categorize the flow in order to be able to turn it into something that will allow us to be able to detect from it. But send me a message and I'll send you the video of how that works if you can't be there tomorrow. Okay? Okay. All right, I'm going to turn this back over to Mike. And I'm going to scoot because we've got a talk at Sky Talks in at 1 o'clock so that I've got to go get set up for. So you're good? Sounds good. I guess. All right, guys. Thank you. We'll see you later. Great. Thanks, Chad. Yep. So Chet touched on a couple really important points in, in how we look at this, right? And, and um, as he mentioned when he covers his um, presentation tomorrow around the Raspberry Pi. He'll go into this in more detail. Um, around that same time, I've got a presentation in the IoT Village um, that touches on um, modeling out IoT behaviors and identifying uh, malicious activity as well. Uh, and a lot of this is really kind of tied back to connecting a lot of dots. In looking at, um, for example, the previous research we were doing around social media, as you identify some of these malicious accounts by which as we showed in the first example, you know, what was posting memes and those were being parsed for different types of commands to further enable the malware, you know, is that potentially an insider threat, right? If you're impacted by that, does that internal user maybe own that particular Twitter account, right? This was some research we were doing, and upon doing so, we actually found in an in instance that was actually the case. So as we were flagging these malicious uh, Twitter accounts, we actually found someone internally was logging into that account, right? So it was actually an insider threat. Um, and, and it kind of begs the question that, you know, with that additional context or that additional intelligence and leveraged, whether it be at your firewall, your IDS, or something else, is kind of a powerful thing. It's kind of a 1% issue, 
but arguably a 99% problem, right? If you've got a breached server device, something else like on the internal network, right? The other thing too is in, in, in looking at um, the baselining, and, and Chet will certainly get into this in a lot more detail in his talk, is such that I see all the normal behaviors of how things are normally communicating uh, over the network or to one another. And if I can find a way to baseline on that so I can find abnormalities, you know, uh, abnormal behaviors, things like that, for example, if an IoT device has been infected with Mirai and I start to see different behaviors on the network, if this is normally just a Johnson control sensor or a Honeywell actuator that sends a signal once an hour or you know, a very small uh, group of packets you know, every once in a while for a status update on a water level, humidity, or other types of things, and it's now emanating five gig of data, there's a big anomaly there, right? So having the ability to baseline on that can be a powerful thing. Okay, so bringing that back to this then, looking at a few other uh, forms of Stego augmented malware, um, we can start to kind of find patterns. And, and as we go through these next few examples, we're gonna tie that back to um, what's actually occurring within the images. How is the embedding occurring? And furthermore, how can uh, a network administrator, someone in the security operations center, um, find ways in which they can potentially detect these types of risks beyond how we think about these problems today. Sundown um, was a particular piece of malware, sort of a kit, if you will, with a lot of different variants. Um, in this particular example, um, it was leveraged uh, as part of a website where there was uh, a hidden iframe. Uh, the iframe itself was completely white, so it looked like it was part of the background. Um, but within it was, uh, was a PNG file and embedded in that some additional information. Um, initially, it was planted there to allow uh, vulnerabilities to be exploited uh, in IE, uh, both related to JavaScript and, and Flash. There's actually three specific CVEs tied to this. Um, but if the browser was vulnerable and the user went to this particular site, uh, this PNG um, would actually be parsed and decoded um, to reveal a malicious uh, URL. Um, and it would be a pointer to another site to further infect via Flash. The interesting thing about this is that uh, it would then pull down malware uh, and infect the device uh, with a Trojan variant of uh, Zeus, um, and then would engage the CNC server for further theft. This just kind of goes through the flow really quick, but this is gonna be important later on as we think about the behaviors and the flows of, of these, this activity. Um, as I mentioned, user goes to a seemingly benign site with uh, an iframe in it, uh, which is actually a PNG, which is going to be parsed uh, to reveal a, a malicious URL that's going to redirect the user to a different location. Um, and upon doing that, um, pull down some malware. And in this particular case, uh, was more uh, bank related for stealing bank information. There was some great information out there on uh, the malware traffic analysis.net site. I don't know if you've seen this great site. Um, they'll have a lot of different uh, bundles and zips of uh, all the files related to the exploit as well as PCAPs and things that you can look at. Um, another variant related to malvertising uh, was also involved a malicious web page, um, but this exploited uh, Mac fonts. So if you had a Mac and you were going to the site, it would exploit and as a result, uh, analyze the images and how the, the, uh, the data, the commands, all of that was embedded was using uh, LSB or least significant bit. And as a result, it would parse and extract that to create an actual string which would then be executed and prompt an Adobe Flash download. Um, and then th furthermore, um, uh, it was actually going to infect the device with Slayer. So some observations then. You can see there's a lot of images out there as part of this Stego augmented malware where the images themselves are being parsed for information. The interesting thing about this is first and foremost, it doesn't break the image format, right? So when I dig a little bit deeper in the next few slides into the how, um, the image is still rendered totally fine, so it looks completely benign. 
Um, and it does this also without uh, hindering the ability to render the image, and there's no viewable distinctions uh, to the user either. So if it's an LSB technique or something else, you visually can't see it. So one of the, mo the most simple things that we've seen, um, which bypasses much of the defense in depth is the ability to just simply append that data to the end of the image. So if it's JPEG, a PNG, or something else, a lot of these file formats have an end of file marker. What's interesting about it is if you add data beyond the end of the file marker, um, a browser, you know, your viewer on, on your desktop, uh, preview, other types of things, just simply ignore it beyond the end of file marker. But all this data is living beyond the end of file marker. Now, if I was to post this to Twitter uh, or Facebook, um, they're going to strip metadata, right? Um, they're going to uh, recompress the file and damage, you know, this data. They're also going to strip off data beyond the end of file marker in all of our testing. And that was part of the testing that supported the neural network research that we had released two years ago at DEF CON 25. And in the context of least significant bit, right, as I break down how the image is actually rendered, right, I've got blue, green, and red, and I modify the least significant bit of any of those or all of them, right, to allow the ability to embed information without visually really changing the file in general, right? If I'm just modifying the least significant bit and changing the color by one uh, single bit, you're not going to visually see that difference in, in the actual uh, image uh, the majority of the time. Um, but there are techniques where you could do the to next to last significant, significant bit, and we've even seen other variants of that. Certainly, um, if I've changed the fourth or fifth one, that's where you start to encroach upon maybe potentially changing the, the viewability of the image where somebody says, hey, what's with all the, you know, the image is blurry or I see random pixels or dots and things like that. So again, I'm just changing the least significant bit. This is all part of um, uh, when, when it's extracted and rebuilt, allows you to actually, you know, build whatever it renders, whether it's ASCII code, the command, other types of things. And so in looking at, you know, how I could, you know, somewhat weaponize this, you know, what would be good sites or uh, social networks to upload this to where it wouldn't be um, recompressed. The metadata wouldn't be stripped. Uh, data after the end of file marker would not be removed, right? So as I mentioned, Twitter and Facebook both have their own compression techniques. So when you upload uh, an image or even a video, um, it may be completely recompressed. Uh, they'll strip the majority of the metadata, although there was an exploit a few months ago related to that, um, IPTC. And uh, it'll strip off everything beyond the end of file marker, thus really rendering a new format of, of the actual image. But not so the case with things such as Tumblr um, or Pinterest or things like that. Um, at a talk Chet and I did two years ago, um, we, we also uh, um, exploited streaming media services. So I set up a, a musician's account within Pandora uh, and actually took uh, an MP3 uh, and modified it and reposted it and later on it played the same song again actually on the streaming media service which I was actually surprised about. I just wanted to see that I could you know modify an MP3, embed it in the embedded JPEG that you see on your MP3 player of the album cover or the song right and sure enough it showed up and it started playing and you know you couldn't hear it distinguish any difference in the music right because the only thing I had modified was the JPEG that's you know part of or within the MP3 itself. So, you know, you could essentially, you know, communicate that over a streaming media service, which I demonstrated. Uh, and furthermore, you know, if you go into Google Chrome and developer options, you can download that song, right? And, you know, if you are communicating this to anywhere in the world, you could download that, you know, and, you know, to the actual recipient, they would know to download it, pull out the JPEG and you know, extract whatever data had been hidden within the JPEG, hidden within the MP3 that was streaming over the media service itself. So 
when we did this presentation at DEF CON, um, Dr. Phil Tully and myself, uh, Phil is the, uh, is the data scientist. He's the one that's got his doctorate degree in neural nets. I did all of the background research and analyzing um, how these images were recompressed, what was stripped and not from each of them. And the premise behind this, though, that was really cool, um, we thought, was um, if I can better understand how these images are being weaponized and how this information um, can survive being uploaded, could I, um, as a white hat, let's say, actually model that out and leverage machine learning um, to actually um, predict a, th a thousand other variants of the same thing and use that as a method by which I build a massive detection capability. And that's what we proved out and demonstrated at DEF CON 25. Oh, and I forgot. I put a screenshot in it here. So this is up on YouTube if you're if you're actually interested in it. Go ahead. Uh, for the previous picture, yeah. The green yes means it is stripped, or does it mean yes it's? That's a great question. I should actually put that put that on the slide. Um, it actually means that um, uh, it actually survives, is what it means. Okay. So green means it survives. Yeah. So if I embedded something in in a in an image and I post it either as a profile picture or just as a part of a post um, or part of an album, you know how these different social networks handle you know those images. Uh, as you can see here, in some cases they'll actually they well strip the metadata or recompress it, but in other instances, if it's a post versus a profile, maybe they don't. So bottom line, the short answer to your question is anything that's green is survivable and is not modified whatsoever. Great question. I'm glad you brought that up. I'll have to update the slides. Uh, yes. I don't know if they changed their policies at all. Um, and Trend Micro, Trend Micro was actually really good about not pointing the finger at Twitter themselves, right? That. Um, uh, so as a result, the only thing that I know is that. Um, once Trend Micro um, had discovered this, they had notified Twitter, and shortly after, Twitter took the account down. Was was essentially that. Um, uh, on a similar note, although completely unrelated, was the the scenario that I mentioned, where you know we we're finding other malicious accounts, and one of those was mapped uh, back to in the internal network because somebody had logged into it from the internal network, which was kind of a surprise to us. Actually, you know, we accidentally stumbled across an insider threat. So. Okay, uh, so last two slides, um, and then I have to run over to uh, our next talk over at SkyTalks. Um, uh, some observations here and, and, and thought provoking things to think about. Um, first, in terms of parsing images, um, you know, a, as we highlighted, you know, it's quite easy to append data to the end of an image, especially a JPEG or, or a PNG, uh, because it's still going to render completely fine. So if I put it up on a website or or, or anywhere else for that matter, unless I'm posting it to something like Twitter or Facebook, um, all that data is going to survive. But from a, a viewing standpoint, nobody's going to really know it's there unless they know to look for it. Um, so uh, you know, one of the recommendations here is that if, and, and this gets back to a presentation I did at Black Hat in 2004, which is um, if I know the tools that are being used to embed the hidden data, rather than look for the hidden data itself, does the tool leave a fingerprint behind within the image? And if I map those out, then I'll, I'll know that, wow, I didn't actually find data hidden in the image or I didn't know to look for it, but based on specific fingerprints or things that are left behind as a part of the embedding tool, that I could actually build a library of all the known tools for basically running steganographic embedding within the images and use that as my detection method instead. So I had written a tool called Stegspy uh, and released it um, at Black Hat way back. And, and it did exactly that. It identified 13 different types of tools that were used for steganography or uh, embedding within an image. Um, and that might be particularly good then when you, know, you have an instance where it's least significant bit um, or uh, DCT as Chet had mentioned in that that's a lot more difficult to detect. Although in the next presentation, Chet's going to show you how we can actually detect that stuff too. 
Um, but that gets back to, well, LSB is really difficult to detect, but if I, I can maybe detect the tool that was used to perform the LSB embedding technique because it left behind a fingerprint, that's going to be a lot easier to detect. The other thing too, and this is more fundamental uh, network security, and that is, you know, as we took a, a look at just a couple simple TTPs, right, is, you know, this outbound, this upload, this access to things like, you know, Pastebin and other types of seemingly benign sites. But in, in the context of your enterprise security, if you're responsible for the enterprise network, do you really want to allow access to things like that? Or maybe should it actually be blocked on the network? That's up, for you, up to you to decide. And then um, I had also touched on um, tying back to uh, social networks of which were leveraged for some of these types of attacks. And beyond um, the insider threat um, that I had, had spoken about, um, if you had a feed um, that was alerting you to the different forms of um, or the different uh, malicious accounts across social, especially ones that hadn't been taken down yet because it can take anywhere from a few hours to maybe a few weeks actually before those are taken down, um, do, does that give you some interesting context in terms of identifying, you know, things related to insider threat or things like that? So if that was tied back to a particular feed or something like that, another thing to think about. So we do find that, you know, uh, Stego augmented malware is on the rise. We're going to continue to do research on this and backfill that diagram we started with to kind of see how quickly this is increasing. We did prove out uh, last year and the year before um, how this could be exploited through MP3s and MP4s um, and demonstrated that. Um, as I mentioned, I had not only done it with Pandora, but I had done things, um, I can't mention the other ones by name, but we, we had done a, a variety of things that we actually showed in the presentation. Um, and, um, you know, so when thinking about this, you know, it does have a lot of applicability to, to audio and video formats as well. And I think I pretty much covered the rest of the, uh, uh, rest of the points. So, so thank you very much. I hopefully, you know, you got some good, uh, uh, a, a few good gold nuggets out of it anyways, and, and some things to think about in terms of, you know, the new forms of uh, Stego uh, uh, augmented malware and things that we're doing research around. So. Thank you very much.